Hello everyone, Adam LaFaccia, your moderator, rejoining you, and welcome back to the Diplomacy in Action online conference, or welcome if this is your first session of the day. This is our second session with the National Park Service. And before we jump into the details on this session, I just want to cover a few technical aspects of the online room with you. Uh, first off, you'll notice that there's a chat box over on the left side of the screen, and you can use that to enter your questions or comments throughout the session today. If you have any technical issues, then let me know there as well, and I can respond to you privately, and we'll sort those out as quickly as we can. If for any reason you have a tech issue that prevents you from communicating with us in the chat, then you can also email us at smithsonian at learningtimes.com, and our team will work with you to get you signed into the online room as quickly as possible. Here's a look at the conference schedule for the day. We've already had the practicing diplomacy from early America to the present in the diplomatic reception rooms. And the archive recording of that session will be made available within 24 hours. So if you didn't get a chance to check it out or you want to share it with someone who wasn't joining with us live, then please feel free to take a look at that tomorrow. And we're about to jump into places of negotiation. And you'll see that we actually have some of the partner sites, some of the actual places of negotiation that we'll be talking about today joining us in the chat. So if you have specific questions, please feel free to pose those questions to them. And keep an eye on the chat. You'll be able to see some responses coming in there. Uh, as well as archiving all of these sessions and posting them on the website, you can find more information about them at smithsonianeducationconferences.org slash diplomacy. And you'll also be able to find information about the badging programs, which we'll go into in just a moment. Uh, this conference today is taking part in part because of uh, the interagency initiative on learning. And here you can see former Secretary Clinton signing that. And we're excited to be bringing you this conference along with the many partners involved in this initiative. So on to the badging and the Smithsonian quests. I'm actually going to turn the floor over to Ashley Naranjo, who's joining us from the Smithsonian, to talk about these a little bit more in depth. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, so Smithsonian quests are actually a great way for students um, as they're hearing about the places of negotiation from Dr. Toothman um, to add some learning extensions to the theme of diplomacy. Um, if you visit smithsonianquest.org, you'll get uh, an overview of the program as a whole. Um, right now, there are currently 24 badges um, that exist, and they're, as you can see, on a, a number of different topics, um, inter inter interdisciplinary subjects as well, and the most recent addition to this collection is the Diplomat Badge. Teachers and students um, have told us that they love the quest, um, that they appeal to a number of different types of learners, and that they allow their students to choose which quests really fit their skill sets and their interests. So it's a great way to incorporate project-based learning into the classroom, as well as um, engaging students in the content of this session. When you sign on to the site, you'll see uh, a familiar voice. <laughs> um, and you'll see the diplomat badge, um, which includes three different quests or activities that students will complete. Each of these quests um, aligns to the sessions that Adam referred to earlier in the day. Um, so we have a quest from the US Department of State called the Junior Diplomat Badge. And that highlights international relations and focuses mainly on um, trade with China. The second badge that we have uh, is the Place Matters badge, and that uh, focuses mainly on places of negotiation that you'll hear about more in this session, um, and especially uh, Eisenhower and Khrushchev and uh, their negotiations and reaching agreements. Finally, we have the Messages of a Movement quest. And this one will focus mainly on the topics covered within the third and final session of our series today, um, highlighting different types of media um, and the messages that they highlighted within grassroots movements, specifically the civil rights movement and citizen diplomacy. And just a reminder again, as Adam mentioned, um, there'll be three sessions throughout the day. And if you missed any of them or you'd love to share them with your students or other colleagues, please feel free to visit smithsonianeducationconferences.org slash diplomacy. And we'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much. Wonderful. And thank you, Ashley. 
And I'm very excited to say that we are here live in the National Park Service offices, and we're about to turn the floor over to Dr. Stephanie Toothman. And thank you so much, Dr. Toothman, for joining us. Well, thank you, Adam and Ashley, for providing the framework for this session. Um, just to give you a little bit more information about me, I'm the Associate Director for Cultural Resources within the National Park Service. And when we talk about cultural resources, we're talking about places that commemorate history, archaeological sites, um, many of which have museum collections. These are all cultural resources that we manage for you, for all Americans within the National Park Service. I'm really pleased to join you today for the second session of the Online Education Conference of Diplomacy in Action. And I'm also very pleased to be uh, joining in this partnership with the Department of State and the Smithsonian Institution. Each of us brings a slightly different perspective on common topics, and diplomacy is certainly one of those. So what do we mean by diplomacy? Well, one definition of diplomacy is the art of people communicating and negotiating, both verbally and non-verbally, verbally, to gain support or consensus, or to advance an idea or program. So in this session, we'll be thinking about how the work and the resources of the National Park Service connects to this theme. Overall, as I mentioned, the National Park Service preserves and protects the natural, historical, and cultural treasures of the United States. We really are focused on teaching people about what the significance of these resources are and, and also why it's so important to connect these stories to the actual places where they happened. We've chosen three National Park Service sites to highlight today because they are all places of negotiation, which is the title of this session. In different, different ways, the characteristics of each of these sites influence key diplomatic negotiations through their role in shaping the character of a key participant, such as Jimmy Carter, in providing an atmosphere in which negotiations could succeed, and we'll look at the Eisenhower National Historic Site, and in supporting the long-term success of agreements when we get to look at the San Juan Island National Historical Park. As we talk about them, we'll learn the stories of these places and the people, and we'll also learn about the people and circumstances connected with them. And we'll learn how communication and negotiation helped avoid conflict or even possible armed conflict between nations. During this session, Experts from each of these National Park Service sites will be joining in the chat area of the website to help me answer your questions. Steve Thies, Chief of Interpretation, will be responding to questions about the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site. Supervisory Historian Carol Hagman and John Joyce will answer questions about the Eisenhower National Historic Site. And Chief of Interpretation and Historian Michael Vorey will answer questions about San Juan Islands National Historical Park. In addition to the pictures and clips you'll be seeing as part of this session, we've posted additional clips about these events. We also will be sending you, and I'll be reminding you again at the end of the session, that for further information about all of these sites, you can check www.nps.gov and enter the name of the park. I also want to express my personal thanks to the work of Steve, Carol, John, and Mike, and all of the park staff who every day work hard to preserve these sites and the stories they represent. So let's take a closer look at Jimmy Carter National Historic Site. Located in rural Plains, Georgia, the Jimmy Carter National Historic Site preserves and interprets the historic resources in rural Southern culture that had an influence on molding the character and political policies of Jimmy Carter. The site includes the Plains High School, which you saw just immediately before, the historic district of Plains, the Plains Depot, and the Carter Boyhood Farm, as well as the Rosalind Carter 
Butterfly Trail. And although we won't be talking very much about Mrs. Carter today, I want to emphasize that the president would be the first one to say that she has been his full partner through all of these um, events that he has led as president, right back to them as young as a young couple going into the Navy. So again, um, we want to recognize her contributions as well. So James Earl Jimmy Carter Jr. as 39th President of the United States brought to his presidency a commitment to change, to compassion, and a belief that a government is only as good as its people. He was born on October 1st, 1924 in Plains, Georgia, and when he was four, his family moved to a farm in the community of Archery, Georgia, where he spent most of his time working and playing with the African-American children whose families formed the majority of com the community of Archery. Living and working with the families in Archery, he saw segregation firsthand. Here he realized that, despite shared values of hard work, religion and family, the lives of African-American families were drastically different from the lives of the white families in the area. The lessons he learned in archery about the common bonds and values that we all share had a lasting influence on his life. From the time he spent in the Navy to his post-presidential years, Jimmy Carter's life shows his dedication to public service, to human and civil rights, and to peace. So I'm going to stop a minute and uh, just pose a question. And if you have some thoughts about it, post them on the chat room. So what do you think? How do you think Carter's hometown, where he grew up, his experiences growing up, influenced his choice to dedicate his life to working in these three areas, human and civil rights, peace, and public service? Wonderful, and just feel free to type those thoughts in the chat box, and we'll highlight a few of those answers as they come in. So um, up on the screen now, you can see a map of the Middle East at the time of the Camp David Accord. During his presidency, one of President Carter's most important goals was to achieve a comprehensive plan for peace in the Middle East, something that many saw as not just ambitious, but also probably impossible. The roots of the controversies associated with the creation of the State of Israel are deep and have dominated diplomacy in the Middle East for much of the 20th century, and they continue today as we see Secretary Kerry continue to carry on efforts to resolve them. President Carter identified three major issues that had to be resolved in order to achieve a comprehensive peace. Israeli security, land ownership, and the rights of Palestinians. As a starting point in resolving these issues, President Carter established a strong friendship and trust with Egyptian leader Anwar Sadat. He saw Sadat's visit to Israel in 1977 as a sign of peace as well as incredibly bra incredible bravery. Um, he saw it as a sign that peace between Egypt and Israel was possible. In July 1970, he began to plan for a summit at Camp David. So what's a summit? A summit is a meeting at the highest level of diplomacy. It's where you bring in the president, the premier, the head of states. A summit is where you hope that after a lot of work has been done beforehand that you're able to reach an agreement. So where did he bring them? He brought them to Camp David. And although Camp David isn't officially a National Park Service site, it is within the Catoctin Mountains National Park. It's approximately 40 miles northwest of Washington, DC in the Catoctin Mountains. It has been a retreat for presidents since the terms of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who called it Shangri-La and it provided a place of peace and recreation and renewal for the presidents and their families. You can see just about where it's located, just north of DC. On September 5th, 1978, the planning, Carter's planning uh, was realized when both 
Anwar Sadat, Menachem Begin, Prime Minister of Israel, arrived at Camp David and negotiations began. It took 13 long, tense days for an agreement to be reached. And we have a slide, uh, I mean, we have a clip posted on the site for you to investigate later about President Carter's own views about how that went. And if you, again, go on and Google Camp David Accor, you'll see that this was a very, very difficult 13 days. At one point, the two men couldn't be in the same room with each other, and President Carter had to shuttle back and forth between their cottages. Um, but they did reach a framework for peace, not the actual treaty, which took another six months, but President Carter was able to follow up on the 13 days at Camp David and make trips to both Israel and Egypt to persuade uh, Begin and Sadat and other political leaders to move ahead. And I want you to just take a close look at this, these slides of Camp David and then compare it with the treaty signing that you'll see next. And I want you to think about looking at the photos of, of their time at Camp David. How do you think the Camp David setting contributed to the success of the negotiations? And how do you think President Carter used this setting to achieve an agreement? And so here they are in March 1979, taking a very important step that has lasted until today of signing a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. President Carter, and again, we'll keep an eye out for any comments or questions you have, is one of four presidents who have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and he is the only one who received it after he left office. He and Mrs. Carter continue to serve as international ambassadors in seeking peace and justice at sites of controversy around the world. So we'll give you another minute if you have any questions and remind you that we have um, Steve Thies from the park, from um, Jimmy Carter, um, here to answer your questions. So we'll keep an eye out for those. In the meantime, I'm going to go on to our next site, the Eisenhower National Historic Site. And what you see here on the screen is an overview of the site and um, its location. Again, it's uh, actually uh, adjacent to Gettysburg National Battlefield. Um, it was the home and farm. I think it was the first home that the general ever owned um, and farm of General and Mrs. Eisenhower. Um, during the Eisenhower administration from 1953 to 1961, the president used it as a weekend retreat and a place to meet with world leaders. And I have to share with you a little personal comment, because whenever I see this picture, as a very tiny little girl, my mother used to have me watch this show called Uncle Bob, and we would always stand up at the beginning of the show and drink a glass of milk and toast this picture of President Eisenhower. which So I, I always smile when I see that because it brings back that memory. But anyhow, during the Eisenhower administration, the president used it as a weekend retreat and a place to meet with world leaders. With its peaceful setting and view of South Mountain, it was a much needed break from the Capitol and was a backdrop for efforts to reduce Cold War tensions. So again, you have a president seeking solace, peace, separation from the craziness and intentions of Washington and the White House through um, a more peaceful, relaxing setting. Today, the Eisenhower National Historic Site includes 60, 690 acres, including three of the farms that were used by President Eisenhower for his show herd of black Angus cattle. We maintain the farm today pretty much as it was during the Eisenhower years with much of its original furnishings and providing, and it provides a unique glimpse of a setting in which relationships of international significance were fostered. Again, um, you also get an insight into the tastes of the day and particularly those of Mrs. Eisenhower who really liked pink. So there's a lot of pink. Um, 
slide 14 here, or our, our, on the screen, is a picture of the president and Nikita Khrushchev. Um, during the Cold War, during the Eisenhower administration, these were the leaders, the, the most important leaders in the world. This was at the height of the Cold War, and there really was an impasse in relationships between the U.S. and the USSR in terms of how to move forward, resolve our differences, and reduce the tensions of the Cold War. Um, just to illustrate, for those of you who may have studied the Cuban Missile Crisis, this is four years before, no, it's actually two years before the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1961. And again, as a small girl, I remember that in our classrooms, because of the concern about what might explode, literally in terms of the Cold War, we practiced on a regular basis, ducking and covering under our desks just in case we were attacked. So this was a very tense period. Um, and although the um, president had invited Premier Khrushchev to Camp David, again to try to uh, provide a more relaxed setting in which to make progress on their negotiations, he realized that they weren't getting any place. And so he decided to take a break and take Premier Khrushchev to his home and introduce him to his family. So another question for you to think about is as Eisenhower and Khrushchev boarded the helicopter for the short flight from Camp David to the president's farm, what do you think Eisenhower hoped to achieve by taking Premier Khrushchev to his own home? And by going back to some of the answers to uh, one of your earlier questions, we may actually have the right. seeds of that one as well. I, I see a lot of people recognizing that at Camp David, people looked very comfortable and relaxed. Uh, Ashley echoes that, that there's just a great comparison of the photos and the leaders, what a difference a place makes. And uh, I, I noted that you pointed out some of these locations are used as weekend retreats when they're not being used for summits in some of these situations, which brings us to the question of uh, how are summit locations selected? Is it usually historical significance, safety, isolation, luxury? I, I probably am not the expert in that, but I think if you look at the places where summits happen, they're usually connected, have some strong political significance associated with the question that's being addressed. That said, they also try to look for neutral areas, I'm sure, and in the case of personal diplomacy, as Carter was practicing at, at this point, um, by choosing one, a place that was very neutral, that was outside of the political glare that people could feel relaxed in, um, that aspect of personal diplomacy was very important in this case, given that um, both leaders were in a very difficult uh, position in terms of their ability to openly make concessions. And I think that's very important in terms of Camp David. Uh, so maybe our State Department friends, if you, if you save that question for the next session, they can give you more specifics in, in terms of current summits. And um, Steve, maybe if you have any thoughts? Great, thank you. And so we'll keep an eye on the chat okay. to see if those pop in. But uh, thank you. And I think you, you gave us maybe a few little clues for this question about why President Eisenhower made the decisions that he made. We, I did give you a few clues few cues um, or clues, um, but let's hear from President um, Eisenhower's granddaughter, Susan Eisenhower, who was a very young child at the time, who's given us two little clips that we're going to play for you that give you um, her memory of that day and uh, her thoughts. Well, first of all, Khrushchev's visit was um, covered by the media extensively. He came to the United States for two solid weeks. And um, at uh, one stage of this uh, two-week uh, national tour, uh, he came to Camp David uh, for a summit with uh, my grandfather, President Eisenhower. And then sometime uh, during that uh, bilateral meeting, Eisenhower got the idea that uh, bringing Khrushchev to the Gettysburg Farm would be a way to break uh, the impasse on a number of important issues, most specifically the Berlin crisis. So my mother uh, got a telephone call 
Uh, this was actually fairly typical because um, Eisenhower entertained a number of world leaders here at Gettysburg. And he said, get the kids uh, dressed up and over to the farm in about a half hour. I'm bringing the Soviet premier uh, to the farm. So uh, we were duly rounded up. This was not an easy task of, you know, four kids under uh, the age of eight. And uh, actually, I guess in that particular case, my brother was about 12. Uh, and we got um, cleaned up and came over to the farm and were uh, waiting for um, the president and the Soviet premier to land. Now, they came by helicopter. Um, and uh, the, the part of it I remember specifically um, was this meeting here on the sun porch. Now, uh, to sort of set the scene, uh, I was sitting in the swivel chair. He liked the swivel chair because he could watch TV and look outside and um, keep tabs on everything going on in the room. Um, and I, I believe that uh, the, the uh, Soviet premier sat in this chair. And uh, the rest of us were kind of lined up around the uh, periphery here. Uh, my grandmother was actually not part of this meeting. Um, I think she was in Washington at the time. Um, but certainly um, my parents were here and my siblings and me. Uh, and so the discussion, it was a very uh, friendly discussion, very personal discussion. And I remember my siblings were a little bit exercised that I got a slightly uh, more attention than they did because Khrushchev made a very big issue of um, saying that there was no uh, name for Susan in the Russian language. Um, actually, uh, they have a name that's similar to Susan, but um, this uh, put the focus on me for a while. Um, my siblings and I thought he was a very, um, uh, seemed like a very jolly fellow, you know, kind of like um, Santa Claus uh, without the red suit. And uh, I think my parents could detect a certain level of enthusiasm, which could be alarming if uh, left unchecked. Um, and there was that uh, great moment when uh, Nikita Sergeyevich uh, Khrushchev said um, to the president, now, uh, on, our, on the reciprocal visit, we would like you to uh, bring your grandchildren uh, to, to Soviet Union. And I could just detect that we were not going to be going to Moscow. By the way, my father crossed his legs. Funny how you pick up on parental body language, but it was clear we were not going to be making this trip in real time. So after uh, that meeting, uh, and I think it was, you know, a relatively short meeting, maybe 40 minutes or so, uh, we uh, accompanied the Soviet premier to the front door. Of the house. And when we got out um, uh, just into the, uh, uh, the front uh, door section, um, he dipped his hand into his pocket. And he had uh, a handful of little red star pins, and he proceeded to um, pin them on each of my siblings and me. Well, um, many people of the younger generation don't know what red stars were, but that was a symbol of Soviet power. Um, and the minute the helicopter took off, my mother said, give me those pins. So we had to take the pins off, and I later found out that she um, uh, discarded them, uh, which is really historically <laughs> kind of a shame. But, you know, we forget uh, from a contemporary point of view uh, what that Cold War was all about and how threatening and how dangerous it was. And my parents were tremendously concerned that we would go... Wonderful. That's such a great uh, personal account our, to hear. Uh, we have a second clip that's a little, a, quite a bit shorter, but um, I think it's worth sharing because... Um, she also shares what, what she thinks, from her perspective, the president was trying to do. And once you've heard that, um, I, we'd like to know whether you think her interpretation of, the grandfather, of her grandfather's motives is the same as yours. Um, and do you think diplomacy would be more successful if we focused on the lives of the people who would be affected as opposed to these big geopolitical issues that we tend to talk about. So let's hear 
from Susan Eisenhower, what she thought her grandfather was trying to do. Well, after this um, lengthy visit to the United States, um, uh, Nikita Khrushchev returned to the Soviet Union. And I think rather miraculously, the uh, Berlin ultimatum uh, was withdrawn. And uh, this is really, it was an extraordinary gamble, I think, on the part of the Eisenhower administration uh, to allow um, our chief um, adversary uh, to come to this country and to spend so much time and to have so much opportunity to talk actually directly to the American people. But uh, also, I have to say, as a family member, a little bit of a risk of subjecting uh, the Soviet premier to meeting the president's family and grandchildren especially. I was about, um, uh, well, I was eight, um, uh, coming towards my ninth birthday, and I'm, I'm the middle child. Uh, so my brother was four years older, and I had a younger sister. And uh, I must say that uh, it was a little bit of a risk to uh, have grandchildren uh, turn up and be expected to, uh, A, behave themselves, and uh, B, to uh, contribute to this process. Um, and I've thought a lot about it. Um, I guess I was a, a contributor uh, in some small way <coughs> to um, uh, improving U.S.-Soviet um, relations. Uh, but I've, I've had a chance to think about it, and I, um, I think this is quintessentially Eisenhower. Uh, it doesn't surprise me in retrospect now, knowing um, a lot about his professional career, um, that he would take a gamble. He knew the Russians well enough to know uh, that families are extraordinarily important to, uh, to them. And what he was really saying indirectly to Khrushchev was, I have a family and so do you. And this is what's at stake. And he used us in a way as props to underscore to the Soviet premier uh, that his grandchildren would be affected by the decisions made at Camp David and during this visit. Um, it is true that in many of his speeches, uh, if you read them carefully, he's always talking about his, his grandchildren. And he didn't just mean uh, my three siblings and me, he meant uh, future generations. And that's the way he showed the Soviet premier rather than just simply telling him. So um, what do you think? We'll be interested in hearing from you in terms of what you think President Eisenhower was trying to do. And again, I want to remind you that we have um, both Carol and John, uh, interpreters from the park, here to answer other questions. There were a lot of references in Susan's remarks to some of the major crises of the day, including uh, the conflict ongoing confrontation in Berlin. Um, we don't have time to cover those today, but um, I, would I would really recommend that you take the time to go on both the National Park Service site about the Eisenhower site and also look up the Berlin crisis because all of those really helped shape um, our lives today um, and the next 20 years of diplomacy. So um, President Eisenhower himself as general of the army uh, during World War II, did get to know the Russians quite well. They were our allies at that point. And that's another part of his story and how he grew uh, both as the commander of the armed forces in, and also as a diplomat as a result of that experience. Great. And I think we'll actually hold for just a moment here to see if any of you have thoughts that you'd like to share around uh, your interpretation of Eisenhower's strategy possibly here. And I notice we have a really great international audience joining us today. So wonderful to see people chiming in from Morocco and Spain and Egypt. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, I'll say one thing that struck me immediately in watching that second video was uh, Susan Eisenhower using the term props in referring to herself and her family members. Do you think she says that with a, a tinge of a, a maybe negative interpretation, or is it positive, but she just views herself as a piece of the puzzle? I think she's being very realistic. I, I don't think it's a reflection that she felt her grandfather felt any less love for them, but he was making a point. And uh, sometimes when the stakes are as high, um, if you can 
uh, find ways to make that point. And in this case, his concern for the legacy that they both were shaping for future generations, then in some ways they were props. But they were also um, people that I don't think there's any doubt that he cared very deeply about. So I don't think it's negative. I think it's just realizing what he was trying to do is to make that point. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. I don't know if that's the opinion of historians, but you know, we all read into uh, those remarks what we see. And that's why we're asking you for your feelings as well. And I like how Stevie notes here that uh, she thinks that the, the word props uh, was used with quite a bit of humor. Mm -hmm. And you could see a little bit of a smirk in, in the video as she, as she said that. Uh, Mike says it was a scary time to be a child, the 1950s, that uh, your recollections are, are straight on. Um, and he distinctly remembers the, that Khrushchev's humanity emerged during this visit, but apparently he wasn't allowed to visit Disneyland. Apparently not, but he did visit, as I recall, a grocery store, which um, at that time our grocery stores were considered like the eighth wonder of the world. I remember also reading recently that Queen Elizabeth asked to stop at the giant in um, Falls Church, I think it was, or maybe closer, but across the river in Virginia because she wanted to see what she'd heard about the wonders of an American grocery store. Um, did very much different times, very much countries coming out of a horrific um, decade in the 40s of the World War II and recovery. So this is a time where people were really trying to uh, shape a future that would be more positive for everyone, at the same time having suffered so greatly trying to protect their own people as well. And connected to this, uh, Crystal in New Jersey asks, is it safe to assume that President Eisenhower appealed to one's ideals, emotions, and core values when negotiating? I think he probably did. Um, I'm not as any kind of expertise on his negotiating strategy, but I think there was um, about General and then President Eisenhower a tremendous level of trust in his in, in, in seeing those as his core values that maybe we don't have after the past 30 years of um, ups and downs with our political scene. But uh, he was really seen as a grandfather, father figure, as well as a great general and president by people who had followed him into war and by little people like myself who were toasting him with our glass of milk. I mean, I can't imagine people are doing that now, but that was definitely a part of the scene. I love Ahmed's comment that came in here that uh, he considers President Carter uh, and what he, he did as as accomplishing the impossible at that time, that it was the, the first time in history that uh, Arabs and Israelis recognized that uh, they couldn't coexist without peace. Right. And as we know, um, it was very brave at the time, and it was uh, tragic that um, from many points of view that uh, President Sadat probably paid with his life for that courage. So that's another part of the story that we can't go into today, but is definitely one to uh, understand and in, in, in terms of what it took to, to reach that accord. Thank you. A lot of great thoughts still popping into the chat, and we'll let you all continue to talk there, and we'll just continue on to talk about the places of negotiation. So right before we go on, I want to uh, point out to you that uh, Carol Hagman did a, uh, also did a great and small, short interpretive video on the actual arrival of the participants um, by helicopter from Camp David and talked about more about the farm. So I would recommend that you take a look at that after the chat today. We're just a little tight for time. And I want to thank Carol again and John for all the great work they do at the site. So our third site today is uh, the San Juan Islands National Historic Park. I will admit that this is one of my favorite places in the Park Service. It's incredibly beautiful. It is well known for not only its beauty, but its uh, access to uh, a marvelous saltwater shoreline, its woodlands, the orca whales, and one of the last remaining native prairies in the Puget Sound. A Northern Straits region. So when you visit it today, it's hard to um, 
really remember uh, without the uh, benefit of the great interpretation our staff does up there, that it was also here in 1859 that the United States and Great Britain nearly went to war over possession of the island, a crisis that was ignited by the death of a pig, but had its roots going back to the revolution and finally settling the boundary between Canada and the United States. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mike Forey, who will give you a great, very succinct synopsis of the war. Oops, forgot to do that. Go. Hi, I'm Mike Forey, historian for San Juan Island National Historical Park. I'm going to briefly describe to you the San Juan boundary dispute, the reason the park was created by Act of Congress in 1966. In 1846, the United States and Great Britain finally decided to divide the Oregon country, which includes today British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and portions of Wyoming and Montana west of the Continental Divide. They agreed to divide it along the 49th parallel the British had already claimed Vancouver Island. They'd established Fort Victoria, a Hudson's Bay Company post in 1843. So a water boundary was decided. And the treaty said that it would go to the middle of the Strait of Georgia, thus through the southerly channel dividing Vancouver Island from the mainland. The Salmon Islands were right in the middle. They agreed to hold the islands in dispute. And this created a problem. British subjects and American citizens on principally San Juan Island, which is only 54 square miles. There were a number of incidents culminating in the shooting of a pig by an American in June of 1859. The British responded by threatening the American with, rest, with arrest and evicting uh, the rest of the Americans on the island, all 18 of them as trespassers. The commander of the Department of Oregon, Brigadier General William S. Harney, decided that wasn't going to happen on his watch, and so he sent a company of infantry from Fort Bellingham, about 20 miles away, under the command of Captain George E. Pickett. The British Columbia governor, James Douglas, did not take this line down. He immediately dispatched a warship to Salmon Island to order Pickett off the island, and if he didn't leave, to take whatever ne measures necessary to ensure that he did. Pretty soon, there were 500 soldiers. There were three warships in the bay, and the commanding officer of the British Pacific Station, Rear Admiral R. Lambert Baines, decided that diplomatic solution was the only way to go. So it was a standoff. Word was sent to Washington and London. It took six weeks to get back there and the two nations immediately agreed to send a negotiator out, and that was the commanding general of the United States Army, Winfield Scott. They quickly stood down the troops and the Navy, and unbeknownst to the governor and the general, the two nations agreed to a joint military occupation of the island, that is, martial law, to keep the civilians under control until they could decide the boundary question. Well, the Civil War intervened, and the joint occupation eventually lasted 12 long years. By 1871, the United States and Great Britain agreed that this particular issue, along with the Alabama claims relating to the American Civil War and a couple of other issues, needed to be resolved so that the two nations could move forward together in peace. The Treaty of Washington was signed, and this particular issue was submitted to the Emperor of Germany for binding arbitration, the first time in modern Western history that this had happened. So three lawyers, who were also geographers, were assigned by the Kaiser to meet in Geneva, Switzerland. They met for a year, uh, going over documents submitted by both nations, and at the end of that year, they ruled that the Harrow Strait to the west was the proper channel. So the British marched out peacefully on November 22nd, 1872. The Americans rushed up with a giant flag to run up their 80-foot pole, but when they got there, they discovered that the pole had been shot down. Well, the British eventually replaced the pole in 1998. We lost our flagpole there, and they provided us with a beautiful 90-foot fiberglass pole. We share a boundary with Canada that is the longest unfortified border in the world, the longest unfortified border in the history of the world. 
and that's a fitting legacy to the peace that was maintained here in 1859 and resolved by arbitration in 1872. So you see, sometimes individuals and nations can resolve their problems peacefully without resorting to violence. And I thank you. And what a great story. And thank you, Linda, for sharing some more resources connected to the pig war story, as you call it there in the chat. I definitely encourage people to click on those links and check them out uh, after this session's done. And so let me catch up with our talk. Um, this gives you an idea of uh, what English camp and American camp look like today um, and the beauty of San Juan Island. This gives you an idea of um, where, again, because uh, Mike's um, map there was a little small, of where we are in terms of the state of Washington, the straits that were in contention. Ultimately, this was the boundary, which meant that the San Juan Islands uh, belonged to the United States. But as you can see, uh, this wasn't a very well settled area of the United States at that time. And so we were very close to uh, Vancouver and the British settlement there. This gives you an idea of what the um, sites looked like during the occupation and also on this very small island you have the English camp that was set up in a very hierarchical manner with the uh, com commander's camp at the top of the hill and everyone below him and the American camp at the bottom which was a little bit on a flatter area and um, a little bit more Spartan. And so we have our last slide and um, our question which would be, um, and I think this is particularly relevant as we're in the midst of uh, commemorating the War of 1812, uh, where we really didn't have arbitration or a lot of cool heads prevailing. And so we fought a three-year engagement to settle the boundaries between Canada and the US on the mainland. Um, so why would a historian call the Pig War the most perfect war in history? And how do you think this location not only contributed to the controversy, and I think if you again remember the map where it was located, but also to the resolution of the dispute in which two armed camps coexisted for more than 12 years while the Civil War raged um, um, back on the mainland. So we, we, something for you to ponder. We'll look forward to some comments. and. Um, we continue to commemorate both the war and to celebrate how individuals and nations can resolve disputes without resorting to violence. And so that's our last site. Um, we really want to, again, open it up for any questions you might have. Uh, remind you to go to www.nps.gov and uh, Linda has been posting some of the sites to look at. But again, these are three sites, and there are many more in the Park Service, whether they be presidential homes or sites of a major battles or sites um, in which major diplomatic decisions were made, in which we try to not only tell the story of those negotiations, but also connect the characteristics of that place in terms of how they shaped the people who were involved, and, and the decisions that were made. And I see an early answer coming into this question. Uh, Betsy in DC says that it was the most perfect war in history because it was settled over negotiations rather than violence. I couldn't agree more. And that's a, a great point. So it seems like the most perfect war is the war that doesn't happen. <laughs> Any other comments? Wonderful. And we'll hold for a moment now while you all have a chance to articulate your thoughts. And please share your comments or questions with us about any of the sites that we looked at or any of the specific events we talked about today. It was really a wonderful exploration of uh, very different people involved at very different locations. But I think there were some very clear themes as well. And uh, I, I noticed that you were touching heavily on the human element of it. 
And I, I wonder if historically that's a piece that can easily get lost when you're dealing with so many people and so many groups. What's your impression on that? Um, I, I certainly, uh, from my understanding of these sites, um, see very, very uh, clearly that one of our, um, in the National Park Service, one of the uh, roles that we can play is to make that connection between people and places, and as well as the big diplomatic story or the big story that we're telling that um, bringing it down to a human level of having you connect your experiences with the experiences of the people who are actual who actually um, were involved in the history created at a place I think creates another level of engagement that you don't get by reading a book or watching it on TV um, whether you know, again, you're at a battle site. The difference between reading the description of the battle and actually seeing the short, relatively short, open distance for Pickett's charge, and you wonder how people ever would have had the courage to run across that open space into withering fire. Those are the kinds of experiences that visiting the place, visiting the and and learning the story by actually being there, I think, is such an important part of uh, the National Park Service's role. And I hope that in looking at these three sites, today we looked at how, again, um, his experience growing up in, in Plains and Archery, Georgia, really shaped Jimmy Carter's character. We looked at how uh, Eisenhower used his personal home, brought somebody into his not the official White House, but into his personal home with his family to really make the point of what the real consequences of their decisions were. And finally, we looked at how uh, cooler heads could prevail, but also how the setting itself, remote, isolated, of incredible beauty, has to have influenced the eventual cordiality and um, and and relationships that prevailed during that 12-year occupation of uh, San Juan Island and contributed to that lasting peace. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, we're in our last couple of minutes of the session here, but we'd also like to hear if you have any sites of negotiation that come to mind for you, be it uh, on, on the scale of something in your community, um, maybe uh, an event that was more politically related to your town or something not politically related at all, but feel free to share the ones that come to your mind. We'd love to hear about those. Uh, also, some great comments popping into the chat around the pig war. Uh, good to keep in mind that there was a casualty. It was a pig. So uh, maybe not the most perfect war, but uh, a pig away from it. And uh, I, I love Mike's common question that he receives here. Who ate the pig? So definitely a lot of mysteries <laughs> attached to this, and maybe he has the answer to that one. I bet he does. <laughs> well, great. As we're nearing the end Lyman of this... Cutler, I believe it was. Mike, did, did I remember that correctly? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're testing you now, Mike, so we're going to wait to see your response in the chat. Or maybe he just shot it. <laughs> well, wonderful. As we're... Starting to wind this down, I'm just going to pull up the schedule so you can have a look at our final session that's coming up at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, Changing America and the People Behind a Movement. Uh, once again, a reminder that if you missed any part of this session or the session from earlier today, or you want to share it with a friend, a colleague, a student, then we'll be making these recordings available within 24 hours. Also, I'm going to launch a very quick evaluation link in the top left-hand corner of the screen. Screen. And if this is your last session for the day with us, then please take a moment to click on this and it will launch a survey in your web browser. And we'd love to hear your feedback on the conference today. But if you're joining us for the third and final session, then hold off, don't respond yet. Uh, wait until you join us for that last piece. I'm seeing a few more comments popping in here. Ah, I'm confirmed. Lyman Cutler shot the pig. 
but he doesn't know if they ate it. <laughs> if he ate it. <laughs> he may have had to forfeit it. All right. Well, I think that brings us to the end of the session for today. But a big thank you to everyone who joined us from the different places of negotiation to go a little more in depth into the issues as we touched on them, as well as to everyone who just joined us to ask questions and share their thoughts. Some really fantastic observations during the session today. And especially thank you to Dr. Stephanie Toothman for joining us and, and walking us through these sites. Well, it's been a pleasure. I suggest you test my memory of diplomatic history by doing your own research. And also, again, I want to thank all my colleagues at these sites in the National Park Service because their expertise is reflected on a daily basis and how they tell these stories, care for these sites. And you can get a taste of that if you can't get there in person by checking their online sites. So please do. Great. Well, thank you. And we hope that we'll see all of you back with us at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time for Changing America and the People Behind a Movement.